Yes. So what I've sent you is a little, you should, you should be able to read it in your mail. Uh, a second R program. So log into your uh, R Studio Cloud account. And underneath the file statement, say there's a new file and it will be a new R script. And then what I want you to do is to copy that message that I sent you, which is all R, and paste it into that new account. So take a few minutes. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. So and if you have a file and then what? Okay, up here on here, and then you'll say new file, and then you'll mouse over to our script, and that'll make you a new file, and then paste what you had in there. And if you want, you can save that file as Galton and Anne's comb data, just so that you remember what it is. And if you're having any problems with that, let me know. Or if you haven't gotten the file, let me know. Um, I'm not sure. if having me just copy this and post it in chat would work, but we can also try that. Go. I'm sorry, you said, what do we click after a new file? I was just able to finally log in. Okay. Here's, so we'll go up here into file and then new file, and then you'll move the mouse over to the thing that says R script. Okay, thank you. And that'll give you a blank thing that looks like this, and it will be called untitled. And you can call that Galton and Anscombe data. <clears throat> and I pasted the whole thing Okay. Um, you don't need to run it yet, folks. Right. And anyone having trouble? So what I want to do and interrupt me, you know, send me a chat or say there's issues here. Before I decided to go into academe, I was a director of data processing. Uh, and you know, I guess, uh, funnily enough, I got out of that because I really didn't like the fact that in industry, I had to account for my entire day in 15 minute increments and it was forever filling out these silly timesheets. I thought there has to be an easier, less stressful way to live. So, so I got into academe, which is a little bit of high humor. When you're writing a program, it's a good idea to leave yourself some notes. And the way you leave yourself some notes inside of R is to use the hashtag, the pound sign, 
And then the text after that is going to appear green. So that's going to be something that's just a note for you. And in this case, what I want you to do is to, for today's exercise, is to install two new programs. So go over to the tools statement and under install packages, you can type in using R and case is important. So it has to be uppercase U S I N G uppercase R and hit enter. And that will install the using R package for you. And the second package I'd like you to install is called psychometric. And hit the return. And that'll just kind of sit there for a while and you will see downstairs in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see some information that it's installing things. Oh, no, you can do this. The first installment is using R, type that out here again, capital U, S-I-N-G, capital R. You know, I would like to be able to do that. Is there a way someone says, Sierra says, can, can I zoom in on the web browser so you can see it better? I don't know how to do that. I can do it in the video after I'm done, but I don't know if there's a way to, for me interactively to do that. So let me broadcast this to everybody. Okay. In the upper right hand corner, there should be a plus sign. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Optimized for video clip. I'm not seeing a plus sign here. If you click on the three little dots in the right hand corner, that's underneath the X. Oh, this? Oh, uh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Out. Oh, duh. I kept thinking you were having to do something in Zoom, but there we go. So. Now I can say install, and then it would be using R is the first one, and the other one is psychometric. I have had my coffee. I don't have any excuse today. Okay, everybody got that? And then moving over to the second line, putting your cursor on that second line, hit the run button. And that will say, hey, R, I want to use this little package called using R. It's kind of fun to think about you know, where our terms come from. So when you're doing a regression equation, how did we ever get the regression, the name regression? And this comes to us from Francis Galton, a eugenicist. Uh, and you know, the funny thing about the Mizzou Library is we may not have the more recent articles, but if you want to go back and get the original article that Francis Galton published in the Journal of Anthropometric Science, We've, we've got that. And if you want to kind of go back and look at the history of racism in 
Western civilization, the 1800s, it was absolutely blooming at that point. There is, you know, studies of intellectual genius. And curiously enough, you know, the, the people who had the most genius just happened to be English. And then after that, the French, and after that, the Germans, and then after that, the Italians, and you know, it just keeps on going through where genius is. And Galton's original idea in studying things was he observed that it seems that people, he, he was observing the relationship between the height of parents and the height of children. And he observed that people who had very tall parents tended to have children that were shorter than they. And similarly, people who had very short parents tended to have children who were taller than they. And his original idea on this was to say that the English were regressing to mediocrity. And after a while, he started to realize that this was all due to something called regression to the mean. Interestingly enough, the original data that Galton has is available on R. So if we're looking at line three, you can hit the run button there and that will call up this data set for us. And the next line has the view command. And you can again hit the run button and you'll see, oh, here's our data. And it opens up a new little window over here. So our program is still over here and is fine, but what we're looking at is our data. And we'll see here, this is measured in inches, the height of children and the height of parents. And you've got a couple little buttons over here you can play with. You can kind of sort the data by clicking on these little buttons. It's not going to affect the numbers for you at all, but it also helps you understand maybe what the range of the variables is. You know, clicking it once you get the highest value of parent, clicking it again, you find that the shortest parent is 64. And sure enough, for our short parents, the children tend to be higher. And for our tall parents, well, in this case, they're not, but coming down here, for some of our other ones, our taller parents also tend to have children that are shorter. And just as in our last time, we can look at some summary statistics on our data. So we can move the cursor down to line five and hit the run button there. And we can see that the mean and median are on 68 parents and children are the same height. You might wonder where he got the idea of parent heights. Well, actually he measured the height of the fathers and the mothers, added, I think an inch and a half to the mother's height and took the mean of those two numbers. Now, just as before, we can plot, make a scatter plot of our data so that we can understand it better. And what's gonna happen though, when I plot this is it's not gonna give me exactly what I wanna have. And I'm going to have to shrink the numbers a little bit here so that we can see our plot here. Galton, rounded these numbers, you know, when he published his little table. So in our scatter plot, you know, there might be three or four or five people in each of these little dots here. And that's not optimal because we could, we could kind of hide the magnitude of the relationship. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each little data point here and we're gonna add a little number to it so that these points don't sit right on top of each other. And that's called jittering. So let me make the screen a little bigger here. Getting there. Yeah, 
in line seven, I have the same plot statement, but now instead of just saying, I want to plot the Galton data set, the variable child, the Galton data set, the variable child, I'm going to say jitter the child value. And this number five just kind of gives me an idea of how much to jitter, how much to move the dots around a bit. And similarly, jitter the parent data and use the Galton data set to do that. So if you go to line seven and you hit the run command, now we've got, going to make it a little smaller. Now we've got a better idea of what the cloud of our data points looks like. You know, and we see a lot more people here in the middle. So does that work for you? Is anyone having any trouble making these plots on their version of our studio cloud? I got some chats. Let me open that up. Oh, okay. So the deal is, I can't get mine to run. Okay, hold on a minute and I'll repeat what I just said because the Wi Fi cut out. So what we've got going on here is if we look at line six and you hit the run command, you're going to see a scatter plot. And that scatter plot isn't optimal because some of these points have exactly the same numbers because of how many digits he recorded heights to. And what we're going to do is we're going to move each of these data points in our data set around a little bit so we can have a better idea of exactly how many observations are right here. And that's called jittering. So line seven gives you an example of that code. So let me kind of make that a little bigger. So I'm going to say the plot command. I'm going to use the Galton data set. And what's new here is the jitter statement says, take the variable here and move it around a little bit. And that number five just describes how much you're going to move everything around. So if we run that, we now have a plot that's kind of a little bit larger and I can make it smaller so you can see where the cloud of data points are. Okay, so somebody, so Vanessa, share your screen. We'll get you fixed up. Okay, uh, let me get the comments out of the way here. Yeah, I kept trying to run it, but it just kept giving me errors, so. Okay, fine. So I'm going to ask for control. All right. And, uh, oh, it should, certainly is giving you some rudenesses here. So let's come up here and see if we can get this to run. Okay. So is this going to run? Okay. So now we've told R, I want to use the using R program and that's got this Galton data set inside of it. So if I hit the run button now, I called up the data set. Um, I can view the data, yay. Okay, and I can do the summary. I think you're good to go now. The thing is about R is if I do this, it's just going to run lot Galton. So for me to run the whole line, I just need to have the cursor sit there by itself. Okay. Like that, okay? All right, thank you. Good enough. Uh, give up remote control and okay. All right, anybody else having trouble? Right. 
hearing nothing. So last time we talked about the fact you can calculate a correlation coefficient and it's exactly the same way as we did the last time. We're going to say core that makes a correlation matrix for us and the name of the data set, dollar sign, the name of the variable inside the data set. And you know, putting the cursor there and hitting the run button, ta-da, I see that I got a correlation between these two variables of 0.46. Now, the book talks about in chapter eight, well, really kind of throughout it, that it's important to get an idea of what confidence intervals are because confidence intervals will give us, I see a chat comment here. Okay. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while to get these things to install, right? So to get confidence intervals out, we're going to need to have another package. Now we installed the psychometric package. And to tell your program, oh yeah, you know, I installed it and I want to run it, execute the library command here in line nine. And that gives you this. If you want, and this is just me introducing something else, you can take a little peek at your data with this command called str for string. And when we run that command, you can see down here, you can make this a bit larger. It tells you inside of Galton, I have 928 observations. And here's the first few observations the first few observations for each of the two variables. That's just there for fun. And if you want the confidence interval, the CIR function is what you want to use. And that CIR function takes three values, sorry, two values. You want to calculate the correlation between these two variables, just as we did up here. And then you wanna say, how many observations are in the data set? And in row, we'll count the number of rows in your data and show you how many people you had in your study. And then the third thing that's a little bit well, optional is you need to specify the alpha level. You know, in this case, I want the 95% confidence region, which is the default. I could have just not had this text in there. And if I hit the run button there, where did my run button go to? I'll have to make this a little smaller. Here we go. I'll see that R returns for me two numbers, 0. 0.4064 and 0. 0.5081. So if you were writing things up, you know, and if you take a look at chapter eight, if we look at these data, we would say that the correlation between our two variables is point 4588, and the 95% confidence region you know, goes from 0. 0.4064 to 0. 0.5081. Now, confidence intervals, you may have noticed the book dances around what confidence intervals are. Oh. Olivia got an error message on the confidence interval. Come back and share the screen, Olivia. We'll get you fixed up. And while that's happening, I'll talk some more.
sometimes people will think the confidence interval is going to tell you, okay, let me request remote control support here. All right, so what I want to do, since it can't find that CIR, the first thing I want to do is to see if, let me have the cursor there, all right. Well, if you're going to move your cursor, move it over to line nine <laughs> there. And let's hit the run button here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. Now hit the run button again. And there's your little string going on. And now we'll hit the run button again. And there you go. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, good. Okay. So I'm going to tell you the wrong way first, because sometimes you will hear other instructors or teaching assistants tell you that a confidence interval means that the real correlation coefficient, the true correlation coefficient is between 0.4064 and 0.5081. And that is not true. In statistics, the way you have been taught it so far, the way to talk about a confidence interval is to say, if I were to do my study over and over and over again, infinitely many times, this interval would capture the true population correlation 95% of the time. So in the population value is something we can never know. We can test the null hypothesis. We can say, is it likely that the true population correlation is zero? <clears throat> and that's what the p-value is for your statistical significance test of a correlation. But we can never know anything about exactly what the true population correlation is. If later on in your life, you take something called Bayesian statistics, the way that machinery is set up, you can start to say, I think that my betting odds on where the true population correlation are fall between this and that. But that's a different exercise entirely from statistical significance testing the way that you've been taught. And I'm going to repeat that a few times every time we hit confidence intervals in the book. Now, last time, Joe showed you a way to make a fancier plot using ggplot2. So if we call up that library and again, hit the run button, that will now say, oh, you wanna, you wanna use the ggplot2 package. And what I've done here is just a little bit different than what Joe did before. He had shown you this little bit of code, ggplot and the data set and so forth. And this is a little different because now I've added to the front of this, this stuff. And what's going on there? Well, that's taking the output and it's putting it into the environment <clears throat> instead of printing it out for me. So if I come down here and I now move the cursor here and hit the run button, I'm going to see over here in the environment part, 
I've got something called first plot. And the reason that I'm doing that is I can then take this as a first step and then do something to it. In this case, because the scatter plot showed us that jittering was necessary, in line 19, I'm going to take first plot and I'm now going to add the jitter. And when you move your cursor, so in terms of what you're doing, run the library statement, run first plot. Okay, well, I guess that was the fix. So here you see the, the plot in the lower right hand corner. And let me. So line 24 has the GG plot. And what we see here is the regression line for the first Anscombe data set. And the, from this scatter plot, you know, when the book is talking about that, she wants you to interrogate the plot. Well, what you're looking for are, does it seem like the relationship between these two variables is a straight line? That's called the functional form. And does it look like there's any observation or a small number of observations that are not being predicted very well at all? That's an outlier. And does it look like there's an observation or a very small number of observations that's really having a big effect on my guess about the regression line here or the correlation coefficient? And this first example is an example where everything's fine. If I want, I can make a regression. That is, I can get the formula for this line. And the way we do that is in line 30, the LM statement. And the LM statement, I'll just post it into chat. Looks like this. And what that's saying is I want to use the ANSCOMB data set and I want to predict Y1 from X1. So that little squiggly mark, that tilde, can be thought of as kind of an equal sign. And if I move the cursor to that line and hit the run statement, I'm going to get the following two numbers out. The first coefficient is the intercept. So I think while I'm at it, I'm just going to copy that and paste that into chat too. The first number is called the intercept. That's my best guess of what the predicted Y score is if I had a score of zero. So if I kept drawing this line down all the way down to the number zero, my guess for what the Y value is, is three. And the second number is 0.5, and that's the value for the slope of this line. So if I increase the value of x for one point, if I go from six to seven, I should expect to see a 0.5 increase on the y variable. Now, the UTS book that you had in statistics in STAT 1200 talked about regression, but you know, it can never hurt to say it again. So are there any questions about this? So this corresponds to y is equal to 3 plus 0.5 times x. So 
So if we take a look at the second one, sorry, well, sorry, sorry, line 32 is an example of controlling how many digits are going to be in your output. So saying print and then a parenthesis and then the name of the model, in this case, it's model two. And then comma digits equals four is going to make the output have four digits to it. like that. So I'm kind of hoping it's a good thing for you to just echo this in chat. Is that working for you? Anyone still, anyone having problems with that? Inside of regression, we might want to look at just how strong the association is without taking into account the measuring units. So sometimes when we're doing regression, we calculate what are called standardized coefficients. And what that means is, what I'm what I'm going to do is to take the first variable and rescale it to a mean of zero and a variance of one. And I'm going to do that for both the predictor and the criterion command. Oh, thank you folks. Okay. So the next two lines that we'll look at are these guys. So this scale command says take x1, but recalculate it so that it has a mean of zero and a variance of one and do the same thing for the criterion, the y variable and the x variable. So when we run that, we're going to get this. And you'll notice we have a couple of ugly numbers there. Minus 1.67 e to E minus sign 17 is that first number. And that's scientific notation. What that means is put 16 zeros down and then 1.67. So that intercept value is a fancy name for zero essentially. And 8.16 E hyphen 01 is also scientific notation. It means take 8.16 and move it one digit to the left. So really the regression correlation coefficient is 0.8. The standardized regression coefficient is 0.816. And that's ugly. So what we can do is we can take that value and we can round it to three digits. And then we see that, you know, we've got numbers that are 
slightly more pleasant to look at. So what I can do is the same stuff. I can make plots relatively quickly for these other four data sets. And that's what you see in this next set. Where did my chat bar go to? For example. Well, in this particular case, you know, the functional form suggested by the scatter plot is not a line. So if we set over this data set, we, we do draw a line, we're making a mistake. And the kind of funny thing about the Anscombe example is this regression line is exactly the same as the regression line that you saw for the first data set. You can use these little arrows and flip back and forth between them. And similarly, for the third data set, we have an observation that is both an outlier, that is the predicted value for that person is way far away from the actual value observed. And that observation is also influential. The regression line that I would draw through these data points, if I didn't have this person, is a lot different than if I did. So this is an example of an influential and outlying observation. And similarly, if I go to the next data set, this is an observation that is not outlying, that is, the value that I observed for that person is exactly what I would have predicted. But this observation is very influential. So if this observation would have had an 11, the regression line would go from 11 to the rest of everybody else. So what we are doing here is just doing inside of R what we talked about in lecture a few lectures ago. <clears throat> 